elections with more than 60 nations that have had headed to the polls or are heading to the polls. Um, among these, India held the largest election in history from April to June with 950 million voters who participated over seven phases to elect their new government. Our distinguished guest today, Rahul Gandhi, the leader of opposition in India's parliament, is no stranger to this stage as this is his second time addressing the National Press Club. When he joined us in June 2023, he had been disqualified from the Indian Parliament, a decision that was later overturned by the Supreme Court ruling in August of that year. In this year's historic elections, Mr. Gandhi was re-elected to his seat in Wynod in the southern Indian state of Kerala. Raibareli, not Wynod. No, but you did win from Wynod. And also won in Raibareli, located in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. As the leader of the opposition in India's parliament, Mr. Gandhi heads the Indian National Development Inclusive Alliance, a coalition of opposition parties that holds 234 seats, just 30 short of a majority. He's a vocal critic of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Mr. Gandhi entered politics in 2004 and has been a key figure in India's political landscape. Today he joins us to share his thoughts on the future of Indian democracy, freedom of speech, and pathways toward sustainable and inclusive growth. Please join me in giving a warm National Press Club welcome to Mr. Rahul Gandhi. Thank you. So, Mr. Gandhi, there has been a noticeable shift in public perception of you um, from being seen as an, a reluctant politician, if I may, to someone who can confidently handle political debates and navigate complex political issues. With the resurgence of Congress in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh and a more open approach to working with regional parties, how do you view your personal and political transformation and what factors have contributed to this change? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it, uh, I wouldn't call it a uh, transformation. A journey? Uh, yeah, a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I think politics in India changed very dramatically in 2014. Um, we entered a phase of politics that we haven't seen in India before. Um, aggressive, um, attacking the foundations of our democratic structure. And so it, it's a tough fight. It's been a good fight. Um, and personally, of course, it has changed me. Um, I wouldn't have ever imagined, I mean, before 2014, if you had come to me and said, look, you walk across from uh, Kanyakumari to Kashmir, I, I would have just laughed at you. And I would have said, you know, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But that was the only way left for the opposition in our country. Uh, media was suppressed. Institutions were controlled. Agencies were attacking the opposition. Governments were being overthrown. And we found that Literally, the only way was to go directly to the people of India. Okay. And that certainly changed me in, in fundamental ways. Right. So you've done two uh, marches across India. One was the Bharat Joro Yatra, and the other one was the Nyaya Yatra? So no, one march. One march. Yeah. Okay, but one was on foot. One was on foot. And the other was uh, by car. So one went from South India all the way to Kashmir. Mm -hmm. That was by foot. That was 4,000 kilometers. And the other one was from Manipur, which as you know, uh, is burning, to Maharashtra. Right. You've already sort of answered this, but I, I still want to ask, what inspired you to take these journeys? Well, I mean, at one level, we were forced politically to take them. Because all the instruments that normally work in a democracy, they just were not working. And you know, the media was not working, the courts were not working, nothing was working. And so we said, okay, let's go direct. And we went and it worked. It worked beautifully. Uh, that was at the political level and at my work level. But as a, uh, at the individual private level, I always wanted to do it. I will always wanted, since I was small, since I was young, I always had this idea that I must uh, at some point in my life, uh, walk across my country and see what it's about. Well, what an experience. And what a 
marvelous thing to do. Um, so as leader of the opposition in the Lok Sabha, how do you perceive your role evolving compared to your previous responsibilities? And what new challenges or opportunities do you foresee in this position? I mean, it's an extension of what I did earlier. Uh, there's an ideological war taking place in India uh, between the Congress and our partners and the BJP and the RSS. They are two completely different visions of India. We believe in a plural vision, a vision where everybody has a right uh, to thrive. All imaginations are free to roam. Uh, an India where you're not persecuted because of what religion you believe in or what community you come from or which language you speak uh, versus a much harsher uh, centralizing uh, vision. And so that that's the landscape. And then, you know, we, we fight on that landscape, uh, defend India's institutions, mm -hmm. uh, defend the weaker sections in India, defend the lower castes, defend the tribals, minorities, defend poor people. Um, and after the Yatra, I feel, uh, become, try to become the voice of as many people uh, as you can. You know, so for that you have to go and understand what's going on. You have to go deeper, deep into sort of the agricultural world, the conflicts that are taking place there, uh, into the financial system, into the tax system. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to, you have to, in a sense, go deep into it, talk to people, and then get understand deeply what they're saying, and then transmit it. Right. So. So and, and at a broader level, provide a, a, a vision, uh, India Alliance vision for the country, which is obviously going to be fundamentally different than the centralizing, uh, you know, monopolized vision that the BJP is presenting. Okay. So you touched upon a couple of points. You just mentioned uh, finance and the tax system. Um, you spoke this morning that 17 secretaries take all financial decisions to run the country. No, 70. 70, okay. I'm sorry, 70. Um, apparently, only three of them are Dalits, and only one is a member of the minority. Now, all of them are... Well, I you've got the numbers wrong, but... Okay. But This is from the audience. It, <laughs> so. Let's put it that 90% of India okay. uh, is either tribal, lower caste, uh, um, or Dalit, mm -hmm. right, and or minority. And their participation in the governance of the country, mm -hmm. in the various institutions of the country, in the media of the country is lacking. And so what we propose is a, a survey to make transparent the reality of how power is shared in India. The caste census. The caste census. Okay. Um, but just to stay on the same topic, um, all the secretaries are from the administrative service, correct? Now, the U.S. Treasury has economists. The U.K. Treasury recruits people separately with expertise in economic policy making. But the Indian Finance Ministry is the domain of IAS officers, of which very few understand finance. Um, will you professionalize the, the Finance Ministry, liberate it from IAS officers who criticize it, and appoint a Dalit scholar like B.R. Ambedkar as No, I think, I think that, uh, look, the, the, the problem is much broader than that. Okay, the, the problem is about participation of weaker sections of lower caste in particular, Dalits, mm -hmm. across the board, right? So I'll, sh I'll shock you by saying that if you were to look at the top 200 corporates in India and you were to look at their management teams and you were to look at their uh, CEOs, you wouldn't find anybody from the lower caste. Right, you'd find only people from the upper caste. Um, same with the Indian media. If you look at media, you'd find that it's the preserve of upper caste. You look at the influencers on social media, uh, you look at the big colonists, columnists, you look at the people who control the media infrastructure. Again, it's the same, it's the same issue. Right? So there is a very small percentage of India which is controlling the entire infrastructure 
what you're proposing doesn't actually solve that problem. No, I'm not proposing, I'm just asking. Yeah, what you're asking doesn't actually solve that problem. That problem is a much broader problem and it's the first step in understanding that problem is actually in understanding what the reality is. Mm -hmm. So what is the participation uh, of lower castes, uh, of tribals, of Dalits in, for example, the corporate world? What is the participation uh, in the media? What is the participation in our bureaucracy? The point I made about the secretaries is that if you look at the Indian government, 70 secretaries basically determine the direction of it, mm -hmm. right? And and I made this point again and again in the election that 90% of India doesn't have representation among those people. Okay, right? just, just as a follow-up, um, a lot of government posts are lying vacant and many government agencies are actually hiring people through contract and not as direct hires. Exactly. So then how, how can you ensure? Well, we propose to change that. You propose to change so that? So in our manifesto, we're very clear that this idea of uh, contractual labor, mm -hmm. uh, we, don't, we don't accept it. We're going to change it. Right. And, right, and many agencies are doing that to also reduce their overhead because of government expenditure. Yes, but uh, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that is happening, but a huge part of it is happening to basically exclude people from lower caste. Because when you look at who, who are the contractors, they're, they're not lower caste people. Right? So the, the question for me, and for the India Alliance is, is India fair? And we've been now independent for many years. Uh, how far have we got? We have a constitution that says India needs to be a fair country. One man, one vote, equal participation, equal participation for uh, all castes. But in, as an idea, caste is outlawed. And then when you look at the structure, the idea is very much there. So the first thing we want to understand is what is the extent to this? And that's literally getting data. It's the 21st century. Uh, everybody talks about data. Mm -hmm. We want data on fairness in India. All right. And once we get fair, uh, data on fairness in India, then we can make policy proposals to correct it. Right. Okay. So India's biggest problem is also unemployment. Yeah. Right. So what is your vision, and especially what is your government doing, say in Karnataka, to create large-scale employment opportunities? So, I've been saying here in the United States that. The West, America, Europe, and India. The West used to be the producer of the world. If you wanted to buy a car uh, in the 60s, you bought an American car. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you wanted to buy a washing machine, you wanted to buy a refrigerator, you bought an American refrigerator, you bought an American washing machine, American television. You guys were at the forefront of that, right? And then somewhere along the line, uh, America decided, India decided, and the West decided that we're just going to stop. And we handed the whole thing to the Chinese. Now, uh, for a country like India to simply say that, look, we are going to ignore manufacturing and we're only going to run a services economy <laughs> means you can't give employment to your people. Right? Mm. So one of the things I'm interested in is, is thinking about the act of production also called manufacturing. Today, if you look at what most American companies do, look at what most Indian companies, most European countries do, they organize consumption. Uber organizes consumption. Uh, organizing consumption is easy. Organizing, organizing production is a completely different ball game, much more complicated. Uh, you have to deal with things when you organize production that you simply don't have to deal with when you organize consumption. So to me, there's a huge opportunity, opportunity for India and the United States mm -hmm. to regain that ability to produce, right. right? And we don't want to do it like the Chinese are doing it. We don't want to do it in an environment which is non-democratic, which is not liberal. So the real question for the 21st century, the Chinese have placed a production vision on the table. It's a non-democratic production vision. Can the United States and India answer that by placing a vision for production in a democratic free society. Okay. And I think that's where a lot of answers lie. All right. Now, to complete, mm -hmm. uh, we have a government in Karnataka, we have a government in Telangana, and what we're doing is there are multiple different 
areas, each area in India has its own speciality of production, right? If you go to any, pretty much any district, Bellari in Karnataka has uh, a, a very deep uh, textile industry which has been destroyed. So we are looking at these at these pockets of excellence and then bringing, trying to bring modern technology, financial support to build them. So the vision would be more of a decentralized production system. Unlike China, which is huge factories, we would be thinking about smaller and small medium businesses uh, and embedding modern technology into that. We're testing some of these ideas in Karnataka and Telangana. Right, and then you'll roll it out to... That's generally how we operate. Okay. All right, so while we're, we touched upon India and the U.S., the India-U.S. nuclear deal led by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was a landmark step in, in, uh, in India-U.S. bilateral relations. What do you see as the long-term prospects for India-U.S. relations, especially in terms of strategic partnerships? You've touched upon it a little bit, but if you could elaborate. So there, I viewed, I, there are two elements. Um, the first is the defense cooperation, which is important. Uh, and I think we do a good job there. But then the second is what I touched on just now, which is China has placed in front of us a vision for production and prosperity in a non-democratic environment. Right? What is our response? Uh, are we simply going to just sit there and say, OK, China can be the producer of the world, mm -hmm. and we're not going to do anything? Or do we have a response? What is our response to the Belt and Road? Right? I don't see one. So to me, that's really where US and India cooperation needs to go. How can we provide a democratic vision of production or manufacturing uh, that actually works to the rest of the world? And I think both countries bring different things to the table. Uh, and I think there's a huge opportunity there. OK. So just staying on India and US, is there a political consensus within India on deepening strategic ties with the US? Yes, I mean, I don't. Uh, I don't see a big diversion, you know, I don't see Mr. Modi diverting very much from our uh, approach with the U.S. and I don't see ourselves changing direction very much from what he's doing. So I, I see continuity there. Um, I don't, I, I think everybody on both sides of the equation, everybody does accept the fact that the India-U.S. relationship is, is key for both countries. One more on the U.S. Um, with the backdrop of an increasingly assertive China, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, and the crisis in Gaza, how do you view the role of the United States in global affairs? Um, I think you're a very powerful democracy. You believe in certain ideas on freedom. Uh, on democratic participation, and I think that's important for the world. I don't, I don't like a world. I don't like a, a world where democracy were to disappear, were to weaken. Right. So I think there you have a very important role to play. Uh, but standing on this side, I see challenges coming that, frankly, you've not faced before, um, and I don't think it's going to be that easy. The, the central question is how do you challenge China on production and value addition, right? Um, China's strength comes from that. Yes, China has a strong military, but the military strength comes from that ability to produce. It, from, it comes from Americans buying Chinese product. It comes from in, uh, Indians buying Chinese product. And oh, what are you going to do about it? Because you can't, we can't carry on on this trajectory. Certainly, I can talk for India. Uh, we simply cannot go forward without building a manufacturing base, without uh, involving large numbers of our people, uh, you know, um, creating jobs for them. So for us, it's. You know, we're not a Singapore where we can say, oh, you know, now we'll do services and everything would be fine. We can't do it. Uh, we have uh, over a billion people, and we have to give them an answer. 
and that answer can only come from production. Okay. One on national security. With India facing complex security challenges, particularly along its external borders, with two hostile nuclear armed neighbors, as seen in, in incidents like Galwan in 2020, what's your perspective on ensuring a comprehensive national security policy? How should in India navigate this volatile geopolitical environment? And you've spoken about um, Very the board. <laughs> you've spoken about the Ladakh border. Without before. making too many mistakes. <laughs> no, I think, look, the world is, is changing. Um, there's a huge increase in uh, China's power. China is our neighbor. Um, we have a relationship with the United States. So we are, we are right in the middle of all this geopolitical change. And so we have to, uh, we have, to have a long-term vision uh, strategic vision and you know it shouldn't it shouldn't be one tactical move after another tactical move it should be okay this is how we're thinking about it for the long term these are the ba this is the basic foundation and we're going to walk on this path I think the central elements of that uh, from our perspective have to be uh, the democratic idea you know have to be the 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 central ideas uh, that our freedom fighters our freedom uh, fighters and Mahatma Gandhi and others fought for, which is peace, non-violence, you know, cooperation, harmony. All right, but it, it's difficult to do with an aggressive neighbor. Yeah, but India's India's pretty smart at doing these type of things. I mean, we can we can maneuver. <laughs> I, I'm I'm confident about that. Uh, but it's important that you know to do this properly, you have to have a very good sense of who you are and what your own nature is. Right. And that's where I, I don't agree with the, the current dispensation. You know, when you, when you imagine yourself to be something you're not, uh, that's when the problems come, right? India is a very plural country. India is an open country. India is not one idea. India is multiple ideas. And when you when you imagine you, yourself to be something you're not, that's when all your strategic problems start. Okay. So I've just gotten a bunch I mean, we're we are weakening mm -hmm. our biggest asset, right? Our biggest strategic asset, India's biggest strategic asset, which is our democracy, which is just not India's asset. It is the world's asset because it's so big. It's a global public good. It's being attacked in India, right? And that is the foundation, that's the foundation of uh, all our strategic imperatives. Right. So you say, I mean, democracy is being attacked. And I've had this conversation with Mr. Petroda, that the Indian voter is very resilient and very um, knowledgeable. It's not, and, and if you see the election results, does, does it give you more hope for democracy in India? I mean, yeah, I mean, recent it does look, but okay. it's not good enough to say that the Indian voter is resilient and knowledgeable because the Indian voter is informed by a whole set of structures, right? So if we don't have a level playing field, mm -hmm. the voter might be very knowledgeable and well, you know, and resilient. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we fought an election with our bank accounts frozen, right? Now, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know any democracy where that's happened. Maybe, uh, you know, that type of thing happens in a Syria or used to happen in Iraq. But we literally sat during our election and spoke to our treasurer and he says, well, we have no money, right? Now, you can have a resilient voter. You still need to run campaigns. You still need to have conversations. You still need to have meetings, right? I've got uh, 20 plus cases in me. I'm the only person uh, in Indian history to get a prison sentence for defamation, right? Uh, we have a chief minister who's in jail right now. So, I mean, one way of saying it is, yes, the Indian voter is very resilient, and, you know, he stands, he stands like a rock. Absolutely he does. But the Indian voter requires an architecture to, to, to work on, which, but, is, which is not there. But would you say that Indian democracy is resilient and it can't be broken? Well, I can say to you that Indian democracy for the last 10 years was broken. But it's on, it's on a, 
upward trajectory. It's fighting back, but it was broken. I have I have seen uh, the the government of Maharashtra just being taken away from us. So I've seen it with my own eyes. I've I've watched it as our legislators have been bought in and 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 hooked off and suddenly became BJP legislators. So uh, Indian democracy has been under attack, has been very badly weakened, and now uh, it's fighting back. And I'm confident that it'll fight back. Um, You know, U.S. is scheduled for elections very, very soon. Um, how do you think Trump and Harris will differ on India policy? And do you think one is better for India? I don't think they'll differ very much on India policy. I don't know. <laughs> you don't? I, I think there's, on both sides, there's basic acceptance of the relationship between these two countries. So I don't think we'll differ very much from Mr. Modi on this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think the Democrats or the Republicans will differ very much. I might be completely wrong. Okay. okay. Certainly on the fundamental idea that India is a partner, I don't think there'll be any uh, disagreement. Another one from the audience. Uh, does the Congress party believe that the caste census is the antidote to the BJP RSS Hindu politics? And is the Congress acknowledging the way forward is a revival of the mandal kamandal discourse. No, I don't. I don't think we see it as anything to do with uh, the BJP's policies. The Congress Party has always, right from even before independence, we've always fought the, for the idea that India should be a fair country, the idea that all India's citizens should be treated the same way, and so. We feel, we feel very strongly that there is a very, very deep problem of participation. And we're going to address that problem. Uh, I don't see it as a mandal versus kamandal issue. And what we're saying is uh, different, than, uh, different than the, the, the idea of only reservations. What we're saying is, we want a comprehensive understanding first of what's going on, mm -hmm. and then we're going to apply a series of policies to correct it, reservation being one of them. Right. We've also said that we're going to, or somebody said one of the, somebody misquoted me yesterday saying that I'm against reservations. I've been saying again and again and again, we're going to increase reservations beyond 50%, and I'm not against reservations. But do you think they should be economic based? Our caste is a, is a central issue in India. It's a fundamental issue in India. So uh, the question, the question, look, uh, I don't think the idea of untouchability mm -hmm. exists anywhere else, right? Uh, untouchability is way beyond an economic uh, idea. It is, you simply cannot be touched, right? So I don't think it's uh, only an economic idea. I think it is, it, it's um, discrimination on many, many, many different axes. Okay. So your grandmother, Indira Gandhi, was instrumental in the liberation of Bangladesh, and the Mohan Singh government also had good relations with former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. What's your perspective on the newly formed interim government in Bangladesh, and how do you see India's relationship with Bangladesh evolving? Do you think it should be party-oriented or people-oriented? I mean, we have uh, we have a uh, old relationship with the people of Bangladesh, and you're right. Um, my my grandmother was deeply involved um, with the creation of Bangladesh. Um, I think there are there are concerns in India about extremist elements in Bangladesh, and. Uh, we share some of those concerns. However, uh, I'm confident that things will stabilize in Bangladesh and that we would be able to have a relationship with uh, the current government or any other government after that. So um, in your meetings on Capitol Hill with lawmakers, was Bangladesh a focus of your discussions, particularly the attacks on minorities? We raised it. 
uh, we raised it and, and they also uh, spoke to us. Uh, look, we are against any type of violence and we want it to stop. And it's the responsibility, frankly, uh, of the Bangladeshi government to stop it as soon as possible. Uh, and from our, uh, from our side, it's the responsibility of our government to put pressure so that that violence stops. Some observers say the U.S. should exert more pressure on Prime Minister Modi, but others say external pressure makes little difference. What is your view and what do you think the U.S. posture should be toward India today? Pressure on what? On Mr. Modi. About what? <laughs> About whatever the criticisms are against What, Mr. what are they? <laughs> you know better. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm asking. I don't. What, what are the criticisms? Um... <laughs> it's interesting you can't say it. I don't want to say it. Yeah, it's interesting you don't want to say it. Democratic. I mean, we're supposed to, we're supposed to have a, we're supposed to have a freewheeling, free press conversation, but yeah, you don't want are. to say it. That's interesting to me. Democratic backsliding, persecution of minorities. Yeah. Look. Uh, freedom of press. The democratic, the fight for democracy in India is an Indian fight. It's, with all due respect, it's nothing to do with anybody else. It's our problem. And we'll take care of it. We'll fight and we will make sure that uh, that democracy is secure. Uh, however, it's important to, to understand that Indian democracy is more than just any normal democracy because of its size. And if you're talking about a democratic vision of the world, then Indian democracy has a large space in that vision. You know, so I think I think it's important that the world sees Indian Indian democracy as an asset, not just for India but for the rest of the world. Uh, advising the United States on how they should deal with Mr. Modi is not uh, my preserve. It's not my it's not my space. Um, we've. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, how do you see relations with Pakistan? Is Kashmir is the Kashmir issue holding the two nuclear nations back? No, Pakistan's instigation of terrorism in our country is holding the two countries back. Uh, we simp we are not going to accept uh, Pakistan carrying out terror acts in our country. We're just not going to accept it. Okay. Uh, and until they keep doing that, there's going to be problems between us. Right. Um, I have a question from the audience, and they've requested that you Hindi me jawab dijiye. ठीक है. सवाल मैं English में पूछती हूँ. What is your stand on the Supreme Court judgment on subcategorization of the SCST reservation? Experts say it is unconstitutional. इसके बारे में हमारी पार्टी में चर्चा चल रही है, और हमने दो तीन ग्रुप्स बैठा रखे हैं जिसपे हमारी ये चर्चा चल रही है, अभी चर्चा जारी है. I'll translate in English, um, just so that everybody understands. She, uh, she asked me about a particular judgment given by the Supreme Court. And uh, it's a relatively complex judgment. So we have a group, internal group, that is discussing uh, the judgment. And so I told her that that discussion is ongoing. We are discussing with experts within the Dalit community and also uh, within our party and other parties. So that's an ongoing discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, so many questions. <coughs> well, well, yeah. All right. Huh? You got I do, and I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but I did want to ask one. So, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi is often seen as a defining figure in global women's political leadership setting a precedent for a strong, decisive leadership at a time when few women held such roles, particularly in dealing with hostile neighbors. Given her legacy, how do you view the current state of women's leadership in global and Indian politics? And what lessons can be drawn from her approach in managing complex geopolitical challenges? I, I generally think um, women are better in positions of leadership than men. That's my, that's my position. Uh, I think they tend to 
be more sensitive, tend to have a longer term perspective. And so the more, more women in politics, the more women in business, uh, the better it is. It is. Okay. And we've been, we've been pushing that along uh, quite aggressively in the Congress party and also in our political system. We, we did the entire uh, Panchayati Raj Act, gave reservations to women. And then we were pushing the idea of reservations for women in Vidhan Sabhas and Lok Sabhas. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm glad to hear that. India has been standing with Israel recently on the Middle East. This is from the audience. How would you change that? No, I, look, I, I think what happened uh, on the 7th of October was absolutely wrong. But I also think what Israel did and is doing uh, bombing innocent civilians, killing women and children is absolutely wrong and should not be allowed to continue. Mm. Um, I'm against violence of any kind and certainly the scale of violence that Israel, Israel is deploying, the way it's deploying that violence, I don't agree with it. Do you think under Modi... And, I, and I actually think it's harming Israel. It's harming Israel more than it's helping them. Do you think under Modi that India has managed the U.S.-China competition well? Well, if you call, if you call uh, having Chinese troops in 4,000 square kilometers of our ter territory handling something well, then maybe. Uh, we've got Chinese troops occupying land the size of Delhi in Ladakh. Uh, I think that's a disaster. Media doesn't like to write about it. Uh, how, how would uh, America react if you know, a neighbor occupied uh, 4,000 square kilometers of your territory. Would, would any president be able to get away with saying that he's handled that well? So I don't think, I don't think Mr. Modi's uh, handled China well at all. I think uh, there's no reason Chinese troops should be sitting in our territory. So um, before I move on to the final question. I did want to take a moment. I'm sorry. I have a lot of paper with me. <laughs> All right. I wanted to take a moment just to thank our headliners co-chairs. Donna Lyman Leger, Lori Russo, and Jed Judson. Um, also, our tireless program manager, Cecily Scott Martin, and our executive director, Didi Asaji, for putting this event together. Um, and it's now my honor to present you with our, with your second National Press Club mug. So you have oh, okay, a. I was wondering what that was. You, <laughs> so you have Thank a matching you. set I've now. I've got two now. You've got a matching set, right? Okay. <laughs> So, all right. So they say pilots have a distant vision. You know, they they're sitting in ones. They're navigating towards a distant destination, right? Now, your father, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, had the foresight to introduce computers in India at a time when many doubted its relevance in a country grappling with poverty. But it became a transition. Including, by the way, Mr. Vajpayee, the Prime Minister. Yet it became a transformative leap for the nation. And India today is an IT powerhouse and a leading provider of IT services to the world because of Rajiv Gandhi's foresight. Right? So you also have a pilot's license? Right? Yeah. OK. As a trained pilot with a visionary outlook. I got into the United States. As a trained pilot with a visionary outlook, what's your long-term vision for India's future? And what innovative st steps do you believe believe could catapult India forward in a similar manner as your father did with the computer revolution? Well, I mean, I think it's a more than what is my vision, right? Uh, I think what is the vision of the Indian people? I think that's more important and understanding that and bringing that together is more important. Uh, I have my views, but I think what India wants and what India thinks is where a vision should come out of. Um, I really see a huge opportunity for India um, 
in rethinking how we produce in the 21st century in a democratic environment. Uh, and that would then include AI, it would include robotics, it, it would include drones, it would include uh, pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that, you would also need to build the infrastructure to do that. So it would, it would include a whole set of things uh, that would make India, in a sense, an alternative producer, it, uh, an alternative to the Chinese way of doing things. That's one aspect of it. Right? Uh, the other aspect of it is the fairness. I think there's huge energy locked in uh, inside India, um, inside the social structure of India, and it's hidden. So India needs to start respecting the skills of its people, the skills uh, of ordinary Indians. Um, and we need to build a system that empowers them and links them to the banking system, provides them the technology to thrive. I think that, that for me is important. And, and the idea of caste, the idea of unfairness, the idea that you know you have two business people who control the entire uh, Indian business system. Uh, the fact you, that you have, you know, they own, Mr. Adani owns airports, ports, uh, the agricultural system, silos, uh, the defense industry, everything. Uh, this is causing a lot of damage to India's productivity. Um, so, so thinking about, about these things and making India a fairer place. I would be, if you ask me how would you define success, uh, if I could make India even slightly fairer, I would say I have been quite successful. Um, and and at, a, at another level where I think we've been successful already is fighting the idea of anger and hatred. You know, uh, the fact that uh, our opposition, the RSS and the BJP, divide India, make you know one religion fight with another religion, spread hatred, spread anger, and providing an antidote to that. Uh, introducing the word love into the conversation, which we did in the Bharat Jodo Yatra, and we did very successfully. I think that's very powerful step, and so pushing that further deepening that, ideas of respect, humility, affection for all religions. I think that is something um, that we're going to push. And it's worked. I mean, we can see even the effect on our prime minister uh, was phenomenal. You know, we are fighting the election, and we are putting pressure on him, and we pulled out the constitution. We used, to, we used to earlier say that he's attacking the institutions, he's attacking the, the courts, he's attacking you know, the media space. And we, somehow it was not connecting. And then one day we pulled out the constitution. And in our, in our speeches we started putting the constitution. And then it just <laughs> it connected immediately. And we then realized that Indian people are not going to allow their constitution to be torn to pieces. And it was quite a beautiful thing because as we went forward in this election, suddenly we were watching the prime minister. And we could see that the pressure was beginning to tell. And then at some point, he just said, you know, I'm non-biological. I talk directly to God. And so the, you know, so the illusion was broken in a sense. Here's a prime minister of a, of a modern country in the 21st century telling people that I speak to God. I'm different than anybody, than everybody else. You are biological people. I'm a non-biological person. And I have a direct link to God. And that for us was game over. We, we knew that we had defeated the prime minister. Right? And then the beautiful thing was the first thing he did when he walked in to the Lok Sabha um, 
and he was sworn in. He took the constitution of India and he placed it in his head. So it was an interesting paradox. On one hand, he's destroying the constitution, he's atta attacking the democratic structure, and then the Indian people have forced him to put it in his head. So that's India for you. That's Indian democracy for you. Yeah. Right. Well, Thank you. Mr. Gandhi, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you know, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru spoke at the press club, late Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi, and you've spoken here twice. Yeah. So thank you. Always thank a pleasure you. to have you thank here. Thank you. Thank you very much.